Good morning, and thank you for attending Chardon's seventh annual Genetic Medicines Manufacturing Summit. My name is Daniel Gataulan. I'm one of the senior research analysts covering biotech here at Chardon. It is my pleasure to introduce our next guests from War Bio. Nathan Jorgensen, uh, CFO, and uh, Mike Pinot, head of GMP operations. Nathan, Mike, welcome. Well, thanks, Daniel. We're really excited to be here at the Chardon Conference. A lot of time, we spend a lot of time with investors talking about our, our really cool platform and our clinical progress, but we really don't get that much time to dig into our manufacturing. So it's great that you guys have this conference to focus on it because we see our manufacturing as very strategically important. We want to have control over our facilities, our process, and our people. So we're excited to, to join you. I think first, if you don't mind, Daniel, we'll walk you through a little presentation to level set on VOR, and then we can get into Q&A. So yeah, so, 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 sounds like a plan. Uh, so just a reminder, we have the format for this session is about 25 uh, minutes uh, chat. So with, with the after the presentation, we'll follow that up with Q&A. Uh, go ahead, guys. OK, we will make some forward-looking statements. So at a high level, what is VOR? We're a platform company with a unique approach where we engineer bone marrow transplants. And what we do is we'll delete off an antigen and for lead programs is using CRISPR-Cas9 and to enable therapies post-transplant. And I'll get into that a little bit later. And we are clinical stage. We have an ongoing phase one, two with our lead product, TremCell, where we delete off CD33. And what we've shown in the clinical trial is in the first two patients, it's safe where we're dealing off CD3 and grafts normally. And then in the first patient, we shown we could dose myelotarg or CD33 directed agent, and it appears safe, or we don't see the, the myelosuppression. Myelotarg is what we compare, combine with our, in our first program, but we think our EHSC platform combines well with CAR-T. So we in-license a CAR-T from the NIH, VCAR 33, and we have a trial this year with that CAR-T in starting in the clinic. And of course we have in-house manufacturing and we'll talk about that a lot today. And then finally, we financed in December and raised $116 million. So we have $230 million in cash as of the end of the year, and that gets us into 2025. So we're very well capitalized. But before I move on to talk specifically about VOR, I just want to take time to reflect on a lot of the progress in cell therapies. So the CAR-Ts have really revolutionized ALL and some of the other blood cancers. However, the blood cancers that have CAR-Ts, as you see them listed here, approved CAR-Ts, they all have dispensable cell populations. So you can lose your B cells and your plasma cells. What you don't see is uh, CAR-Ts in acute myeloid leukemia or AML. And that's because you can't lose your myeloid lineage. Or if you hit your myeloid progenitor cells, it's fatal. So that's why you don't see it. What we believe is that our approach of deleting an antigen off an EHSC or, or a bone marrow transplant, we can enable highly potent therapies. And that's really the promise of our platform, which we could potentially make CAR-Ts a reality for AML and some of these other blood cancers. So how, how, what are we doing and how is it a little different? So typically when you develop or the traditional paradigm for developing therapies for cancers is you find an antigen that's expressed on the cancer and then you develop a drug that targets it. The problem is, is that there aren't any really good targets. So cancers of course are derived from our own bodies. So there are very limited number of really specific cancer targets. And so once you start targeting that agent, you start killing healthy cells. And, and the genius of our founder, Sid Mukherjee, is to flip that paradigm on its head. Instead of, instead of focusing on, on finding an antigen on the cancer, let's start with some healthy cells and remove an antigen and create that, that cancer-specific antigen. And we believe by doing that, we can open up uh, new targets for therapies and make drugs that are on the market, such as Molotar, more, more efficacious by limiting the toxicities. And we'll get into that on the next slide. We walk through the blood cancers. 
So th this approach applies nicely to blood cancers because what the standard of care is for a lot of blood cancers is a bone marrow transplant. So the, these patients get a lot of chemotherapy and hopefully rid the patient of the, of the cancer and then get a bone marrow transplant in which it re repopulates the blood system. However, sometimes that sometimes it's not completely effective and the cancer comes back post-transplant. So what we do is we take those cells, the, the bone marrow transplant cells that are out of the body prior to transplant and we delete off an antigen. And as I mentioned, our lead program, we use CRISPR-Cas9 to delete off CD33. And we think what that will do is enable therapies post-transplant. So that bone marrow transplant will repopulate the blood system that new blood system won't express the antigen. And now the only cells in the body left that are expressing that specific antigen is the cancer. So we think this has the potential to really transform outcomes in a lot of blood cancers, including AML. And just to walk you quickly through our pipeline before turning it over to Mike to talk about manufacturing. Our lead program is TremCell, as mentioned, that's uh, EHSC, or engineered hemoplatic stem cell transplant, where we delete off CD33. And our lead program, the ongoing phase one, two trial that I mentioned, where we released the first couple of patients with the data, we paired our stem cell transplant with Molotar. So Molotar is an approved ADC that's targeted CD33. And the goal of that trial is just to show that trend cell is safe and that we can protect from the myeloid toxicities that Molotar, you typically see with Molotar. That's also, I mentioned earlier, what we really wanna do is combine trem cell with a CAR T. So our ultimate vision is to have trem cell followed by CAR T post-transplant. And our long-term vision is that it can be even the same donor that donates and provides both the stem cells and then the T cells for the transplant. So we in license this CAR T, VCAR 33 allo from the NIH. And it's actually in an ongoing pediatric trial as an autologous CAR-T. What we wanna do is develop it as an allogeneic CAR-T, and that's a trial we're gonna file an IND for in the first half of this year. And what we, the, the trial this year is just as a monotherapy, but it, ultimately we wanna combine it as a treatment system. So we get this pairing that we think is gonna be highly potent. And then our approach is, is very powerful. We think we not only can enable a single targeted CAR T, but we can enable multi-targeted CAR Ts. So we have a program that we have announced where we're developing a CAR T against both CLL1 and CD33. These are a couple of very common targets that a lot of companies are going after. And we're gonna put that behind an engineered EHSC where we delete out both of those, those targets. So we're making a lot of progress on that end too. So there's a lot of power to this platform. So that's just a very quick overview. I think if anybody really wants to dig in and they're new to the story, there's some slides online that they can, they can look at. Or of course, you can reach out anytime. We're always very happy to walk investors through the story. But now I'll turn it over to Mike, who will go walk us through our manufacturing. So our trend cell process is a relatively quick process between three to five days of manufacturing. We start with uh, apheresis material from a matched donor. Uh, we do cell selection at that point and then run into electroboration to make the uh, engineered HSCs and then we have product. We're able to get that generally to the patient within seven to 10 days of manufacturing. Uh, so a very quick turnaround from the start of manufacturing. Uh, once we get into the treatment system, we're able to take that original starting material and take the non-target cells from the first cell selection and use that to make the CAR-T program. So uh, just one collection to make two products. And then the CAR-T product, again, is a very quick process. Uh, it starts with cell selection, transduction, and then we end up with our CAR-T. And we'll be able to get that to the patients in about two weeks post-manufacturing as well. Uh, so some of the advantages of in-house versus contract uh, cell manufacturing. So uh, it was the fastest operational path and easiest scaling for contract manufacturing. Obviously, you don't have to build a facility. Uh, In-house, we're located here with our process development group and our research group. Uh, so we're able to 
bounce ideas off very quickly. We have dedicated staff here uh, for all our manufacturing control over the manufacturing slots, and it'll be more cost effective over time. Uh, so some of the decisions we made, uh, so we do use a CDMO for the trend cell manufacturing. Uh, that was to get to the IND faster. Um, for the CAR-T, we are going to use our internal manufacturing right from the get-go. Uh, that allowed us to do development work and tech transfer in, in parallel, uh, so a little bit faster there. Uh, for the combo trials, we'll use both in-house and contract manufacturing uh, just as a redundancy. And then for commercial manufacturing, we'll use both as well. I think that that's it for our presentation, Daniel. So we're ready for all your questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a great, uh, helpful overview. So uh, let, let me jump in with questions. And uh, as a reminder to the audience, if you do have any questions, please type them in under the uh, video uh, player and uh, we'll do our best to, to get to those questions. Um, all right. So, so first, um, I guess uh, you spent some time about your approach, maybe uh, dive it a little bit deeper into it and uh, specifically, how are you leveraging uh, gene editing within AML and uh, if you can comment on the current unmet need? Yeah, so thank you for the question, Daniel. So we think we have actually one of the most elegant approaches to gene editing. And actually, I, when I first came across VORA, I was on the investor side. And I stayed away from a lot of the gene editing companies because they just seemed a lot of big science experiments, you know, just playing around with different gene editors. But this approach is pretty elegant because it takes these cells that are already out of the body, it's very simple and just leads off an antigen. And then when it goes back in the body, of course it solves this big unmet need for AML, which is the lack of cancer specific targets. And if you look at the unmet need in AML, there's 20,000 people diagnosed each year with AML. But if you look at like the drugs, there's no blockbuster. And the reason for that is actually there's, there's no really good target, but we think this approach can change all that. We can make CD33 a really good target. We can make CLL1 a really good target and change the outcomes for these patients. So we're very excited for what this platform can do for AML, but then we can go beyond that. Because if you look at the other blood cancers, there are targets that have kind of went up poof in phase two, three trials because of myeloid toxicity. And that's exactly what our platform solves for. If we can delete those antigens off the myeloid compartment, we can solve for myeloid toxicity. Got it, to understand. Um, in, in terms of uh, manufacturing, you know, you listed some benefits of uh, in, in house versus um, CDMO. Uh, in, in your specific case, what uh, do you find as perhaps the most significant benefits of uh, the in-house facility? Yeah, so just the one thing that I think a lot of people think is that it's, it's incredibly expensive to, to build out in-house. And for a lot of people's processes where they need large stainless steel vats, that's definitely the case. But with our simple process, as Mike described it earlier, where we we, we don't grow the cells, we take them from a donor and then we process them in a pretty short time period. It doesn't require a, a ton of infrastructure. So one of the benefits actually is that we can do this pretty cheaply, almost at the same cost as using a, a CDMO, but we have control over it. And control is very important in cell and gene therapy because it's, it's not as simple as small molecules. It actually requires a highly skilled operators that know your process deeply and are dedicated to it. And so that's that's the big benefit, but this is really Mike's domain. So I'll let, I'll let him comment. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the bigger benefits as an operation person is the, the ability to have research and PD on site with us. So anytime uh, we have issues or we're looking for process improvements, we can go to SMEs relatively quickly um, the speed for tech transfer is, is very fast. Uh, we're training with the PD team as they're developing it as well. Got it. And I, I guess along, along the same lines, um, what, what would you say are the most significant uh, drawbacks for in-house manufacturing? 
I think, you know, the utilization of resources between manufacturing runs. Uh, so we do have a short process. Uh, so we have a very intense manufacturing timetable and release timetable. Um, so utilizing those resources in between runs uh, can be an issue. Uh, right now, we're utilizing the team to bring in the trem cell product in-house as well as the CAR-T to try to make sure there is enough work and it's kind of a level workload. Got it. And uh, you, you briefly mentioned on uh, product development. Uh, can, can you comment a little bit more, I guess, in terms of uh, the benefits of having the in-house in uh, manufacturing uh, capabilities and uh, how it affects your uh, product development? Yeah, I mean, cell therapy is very complex. Uh, we have a starting material that's different every time from a healthy donor. Uh, so having PD co-located, if we see something that we haven't seen in the past, uh, we can go right to the SMEs and have a conversation and, and make real-time changes to make sure the patient gets a, a safe product. Um, that collaboration is, you know, we'll continue to use that as we move through the phases uh, to make sure that we're able to commercialize the product. Got it. Um, I, I guess sh shifting uh, towards capacity, what what are um, what is your current capacity and what is the, uh, the ability to support your existing programs? Um, I mean, you, you, you briefly mentioned, you know, so, so the breakdown of uh, the in-house uh, use of resources for, uh, and CDMOs, but in, in terms of your, your own in-house uh, facility, what are the capacity? So we believe our, our current capacity for our in-house will meet all our clinical trial demands. Um, we do have the facility designed to do multi-lot, multi-product at the simultaneously. Uh, so we believe it will take us for a few years to meet all our demands. Okay. And and beyond that, uh, really, is it expandable to uh, support commercial production in the future? So we're still defining our commercial strategy. Uh, we One of the options is to do a launch out of our current scale, uh, but we're also a, exploring other opportunities and for commercial launch. Got it. Okay. So um, I guess another, another thing that uh, some of the companies comment on uh, with respect to having uh, in-house facilities are COGS advantages. Uh, so can, can you uh, comment on, on your COGS for Tramcell and uh, Vicar 33? Uh, how should you be thinking about those? Uh, we anticipate our COGS to be in line with other cell therapies that are out there and being developed. Um, we are actively looking at COGS and, and working with our critical reagent manufacturers uh, to see what kind of volume discounts we can get and long-term pricing. Other thing I'll note here is that when we were making the decision to build our internal manufacturing and compare it to CDMO, the break-even actually was very quick. And that's because we use very Dedicate, bespoke dedicated machines for, for processes. And so actually when we would go to a CDMO, we would have to train the technicians there and then actually provide the equipment. And since we don't need big stainless steel vats, you know, we can't leverage a lot of the existing infrastructure, but it's just equipment. And so that's why, you know, it's, it's not really that cost effective for us to use a CDMO. And that's, that's why the decision to, to bring it in-house was actually one of the easiest decisions I made as a CFO since joining BOR. Got it, understand. Um, so, so it looks like you've done, uh, you know, significant progress in uh, scaling up your process uh, to date. Uh, what, what should we expect to see from uh, that along the same lines in the next, say, 12 to 24 months? Yeah, so as with most cell therapies, you know, scaling is really about scaling out and being able to produce more lots. Uh, so we have brought more capability or more slot availability at our CDMO, uh, which will carry us through our demands this year for trend cell. Um, with our internal facility coming online, we will bring additional capacity uh, early next year and we'll be able to meet all the demands between the two of them. Got it. Um, all right. Uh, so, what one um, observation or what one common theme that that we saw last year in 2022 was the difficulty in um, acquiring and uh, retaining talent. Um, 
not not just in biotech but in manufacturing uh, more more specifically uh how challenging are you fi fi finding the uh hiring market right now for manufacturing and um have you seen any changes in the past uh, few months to a year uh so you know hiring been really good for us um we were able to build our team and, and stay on our hiring plan pretty aggressively um we were uh we're on the boston business journal uh, best places to work we're a dynamic biotech uh so um, the candidates we have been getting in the door have been really excited to join, and we've been seeing a lot of referrals and a lot of people come through. Excellent. That's uh, that's a that's a great sign. And uh, finally, I have one uh, one last question. Um, again, uh, along the same uh, lines of uh, um, pan pandemic related uh, difficulties, uh, was the supply chain that was severely affected over the past couple of years. Um, are you seeing uh, ongoing issues uh, for equipment and materials, or are those starting to ease? I, I think you know most of it has resolved. Uh, some of the equipment still does have an extended lead time, um, so we've been able to stay ahead of it by, you know, good planning, ordering well in advance of when we anticipate the needs are, and uh, just maintaining a proper inventory where we used to do three six months for probably six to twelve months of inventory now. Uh, just so we can avoid any issues with supply chain. Yeah, got it. Excellent. Well, that that brings me uh, to the end of my questions. Um, I don't see any questions from from the audience at this point. But if you guys have any uh, concluding remarks, uh, please go ahead. Well, thank thank you, Daniel, for for having us here. You know, we're just excited to talk about forest manufacturing. As mentioned earlier. We do see it as a very strategic advantage, and it's definitely very important for cell and gene therapies for success. So thank you for having us. Thank you. I appreciate your time.